I want to acknowledge that we gather on Treaty 1 territory, on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe peoples, and the homeland of the Métis Nation. This past biennium has been amazing for our church, and indeed for the whole Lutheran communion. We have been commemorating the 500th anniversary of the Reformation under the theme, Liberated by God's Grace. As part of that commemoration, truly historic and significant events have been taking place. On October 31st, 2016, in Lund, Sweden, there was a service of common prayer commemorating the Reformation anniversary, co-presided by the Pope, the LWF General Secretary Martin Junge, and the LWF President Muni Bunan. Fifty years ago, twenty years ago, ten years ago, who would even have thought that such a thing was possible? The LWF 12th Assembly was held in May 2017 in Windhoek, Namibia. The choice of location signaled that the Lutheran Communion is now truly global in nature and that the places where the churches are growing fastest are in the global south. The assembly was amazing. We had a strong Canadian contingent that provided significant leadership within the assembly. The worship was inspiring. How I would have loved to bring any one of those African choirs over here to sing with and for you. The speakers were thoughtful and challenging. The business was reflective and forward-thinking. And on the Sunday of the assembly, we held a global commemoration of the Reformation with 10,000 worshipers in a football stadium. It was joyous. In his report to the Lutheran World Federation Assembly, General Secretary Martin Junge told the following story. While visiting the Evangelical Lutheran Church of the Augsburg Confession in Slovakia, he was in a church listening to a bell choir from one of the Lutheran schools. He told us in listening to the bells, he finally understood that this is a perfect analogy to speak about our shared life as a communion of churches. He said, like bells, the LWF brings together churches of different sizes, ages, and profiles. These churches have all been touched by the gospel message, and in listening to God's voice, they have all found their own distinctive voice to witness to the living God in their midst. He went on to say, No church should think itself too small while holding that one single bell that God has given it. No church should doubt that it can make a difference in a large communion like ours or in a world big and complex like the one we live in. Conversely, no church should think itself too big, as if it holds the one single bell that is able to play on its own the tune of a large communion like ours. It takes all to play the communion's tune of faith that praises the triune God and offers its witness of justice, peace, and reconciliation in our world. Well, when I heard Martin Junge say these words, I too had an aha moment. And I thought, this is also a perfect analogy for us to speak about our life together as the ELCIC. And for the record, I'm using this with his permission. No congregation or specialized ministry or synodically recognized ministry or area or conference or synod is too small that it can't make a difference while it plays the single bell that it has been given. And no congregation or specialized ministry or synodically recognized ministry or area or conference or synod is too large that it doesn't need the others. It is only together that we can play the song that God has given us, a song that proclaims the liberating power of God's grace to a world in need and in our Canadian context. That has been perfectly illustrated by your amazing participation in the Reformation Challenge. Look at what we have been able do, to do working together. I'm so impressed by the way you have embraced the Reformation Challenge, but also by the other ways, the number of symposia and hymn fests and joint worship and concerts, and I heard a polka party happening in Winnipeg. 
and other events that are being held across Canada as part of our Reformation commemoration. This has been a time for us to realize that we have come to age as a church. We are not just a church and a communion that looks back to the events of our founding. We are a church that God is calling into a challenging and uncertain future, but with the promise that God's hand is leading us and that God's spirit is guiding us. Let me spend some time talking about the four strategic directions that have guided our work over the last two years. I'm delighted by the way the call to spiritual renewal is being picked up across our church. It's a big way, a big part of the way we live out our commitment to spirited discipleship as together we pray, read, worship, study, serve, give, and tell. Maybe you can't recite all of these seven areas in order like I can, but the call to spiritual renewal is not about a program. It's about renewing who we are as God's people at our core. And I see that. I see that as I travel across our church, whether it's at the National Youth Gathering or the National Worship Conference, at Synod Council meetings or Synod Conventions, at gathering with diaconal ministers or with a Swami conference, I see not just church members, but disciples whose faith is alive. I see God active and present in the midst of your gatherings as you worship and pray, read scripture and study theology, are involved in mission at the local level and beyond, as you give generously not just to our church, but to provide for the needs of others around the world and as you tell the good news of Jesus Christ in both words and deeds. One of the ways we are encouraging spirited discipleship is through the creation of a new ELCIC in Mission for Others Leadership Award. National Church Council believed that this 500th anniversary was a good time to start this award and understands that by lifting up one example of spirited discipleship in our church, we honor all the members of our church. And I'm delighted that we will recognize our first recipient of this award later tonight. I am committed to the ongoing call for spiritual renewal within our church. I am convinced that these ancient and continuing spiritual practices are what we need to deepen our relationship with God and equip us for the baptismal life of discipleship to which we have been called. Spiritual renewal is part of what will make us a healthy church, the second of our strategic directions. When we adopted healthy church as a strategic priority, we did so acknowledging that we were in many places in a state of unhealth. Conflict within the church, fear of an uncertain future, mistrust between the levels of the church in a variety of combinations had led us into some unhealthy patterns. I'm happy to report to you that I continue to, continue to see huge changes across our church, that we are learning how to work together as the body of Christ, as a team. We are indeed being blessed with the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let me share with you some examples of how we are practicing being a healthy church. The Global Mission Task Force was made up of representatives between the synods and the national church. Over deep and sometimes challenging conversations, they worked out a new agreement on ways that we can cooperate best in this important area of ministry. We have prepared a new brochure which highlights global ministry in the ELCIC, and you'll find that handed out on your tables today. The ongoing work of the Faith, Order, and Doctrine Committee on Orders of Ministry included a time of deep listening with our diaconal ministers at the diaconal gathering last May. Maybe this sounds obvious to you, but it demonstrates a conscious decision to ensure full and fair participation of stakeholders as we make decisions going forward. Our whole church had the opportunity to participate in this conversation through the study document to love, and, to love our neighbors as ourselves, a study on orders of ministry in the ELCIC. Through the Church Extension and Capital Fund, the CECF, the ELCIC has provided a total of $300,000 to each synod 
For synod mission initiatives, funds will be used for activities that are experimental in spirit and genuinely seek to explore what it means to participate in God's mission in the world today. The intent of this project is for the ELCIC to journey with synods, encouraging them to discern experiments in participating in God's mission in our current context, and to reflect with synods on these experiments in order to learn how to steward the use of future CECF funding. The five synods are allocating their funding in five totally different ways. It's a sign of the way we are learning to respect and appreciate regional differences within our church. Following up on a convention motion from two years ago, a task force is working to encourage conversations across the church on the needs of people in times of dying and death and to recommend revisions to the ELCIC's policy on decisions at the end of life. The study guide for conversations on medical assistance in dying is now available on the ELCIC website. I think it's a sign of maturity in our church that we can tackle difficult subjects and reflect together personally and theologically. Work has been done with the Conference of Bishops, Group Services, Inc., and National Church Council to make more specific the letter of call for rostered ministers and to create an employment contract. I know that this is a new way of thinking about the relationship between rostered leaders, congregations, and the synod, and that there are some concerns. But I strongly believe that this is a good step to creating open and healthy working relationships in the church. Once again, we have produced an annual report that shares more stories about the work of our church. You'll find a copy of the report on your tables. I invite you to read it, please, and to take it home and share it widely. Additional copies are available from the ELCIC display or just by calling the national office. Just ask Trina. One of the signs of our increased health is our increased participation in the work of compassionate justice, our third strategic direction. Our work continues in our major commitments to reconciliation with Indigenous peoples, care for creation, peace in the Holy Land, homelessness and affordable housing, and responsible resource extraction. We do this work at local, national, and international levels with a variety of partners. You can learn more about this work in the report of the National Office in your Bulletin of Reports. Let me share with you a few examples of the way that I have personally been involved in compassionate justice work. In August 2015, I had the opportunity of an, uh, an honor of attending Anglican Sacred Circle. We do not have a very large Indigenous presence in the ELCIC, and I'm really grateful for the way the Anglican Council of Indigenous Peoples has invited me to walk with them. I've learned so much from listening to the concerns of Indigenous people within the Anglican Church. My hope and prayer is that this relationship will continue to deepen so that ASEP might mentor us in our walk towards reconciliation. In October 2015, I had the opportunity to be part of a meeting on Sami territory in Sweden entitled The Future of Life in the Arctic, The Impact of Climate Change, Indigenous and Religious Perspectives. People of the North are witnessing firsthand the effects of climate change. We heard about the connection between the suffering of the land and its effects on traditional livelihoods, the mental health, identity, and well-being of all who live there. We learned that climate change constitutes the single most important threat to food food security due to the changed and changing environment, disrupted migratory patterns, and the high cost and limited availability of market foods. Climate justice for the Arctic is a spiritual issue, and the power to change comes from spiritual sources. Climate justice is intergenerational, needs to include the people of the Arctic, and calls for common but differentiated responsibilities. In March 2016, I participated in an ecumenical event in Ottawa that lifted up the commitment by various churches to continue responding to the calls to action of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. In the past several years, I've participated regularly in the Thursdays in Black campaign that lifts up concerns about gender-based violence. In Canada, we don't have to face directly the issue of rape as a weapon of war. 
Our challenges include the continuing crisis of missing and murdered Indigenous women, and we also need to address the ways that women experience sexual violence in our society and in our church. We need to speak more openly and clearly about the ongoing epidemic of domestic violence. And we need to continue to speak out about human trafficking in Canada, especially as it pertains to the modern slavery of many sex trade workers. I would invite you to continue to participate in this weekly campaign. You were all invited to wear black today, and you've received buttons for the Thursdays in Black campaign on your tables. We're going to ask that everyone who's wearing black come forward at the end of the business session today, not now. And we're going to take a picture to show the ways that our church wants to support this campaign. So if you just come forward right at the end um, after the announcements and the closing prayer. Last month, Statistic Statistics Canada released information on hate crimes in Canada. Sadly, they reported an increase, including a 60% raise in hate crimes against Muslims. The Jewish community remains the most targeted for hate crimes. This year in March, I wrote to the church and called for prayers and solidarity following attacks on Jewish community centers, synagogues, and cemeteries in Canada. In January, I issued a call for prayers and solidarity following the fatal attack at Le Centre Culturel Islamique de Québec. We need to do more to counter the increase in suspicion and hostility towards people of other faiths. Our convention is going to consider a proposed ELCI statement to Muslims in Canada and a motion on encountering people of other faiths' interfaith guidelines. I think these are two concrete actions that we can take that will enable us to be good neighbours and to welcome the stranger in our increasingly multi-faith and multicultural society. After my letter regarding attacks on Jewish community centres, I received this greeting for our convention from Rabbi Shimon Koffler Fogel, CEO of the Centre for Israel and Jewish Affairs. These are his words. On behalf of the organized Canadian Jewish community, I extend my heartfelt wishes to all attending the ELCIC's biennial, biennial convention. At a time of rising global uncertainty and divisiveness, people of faith are uniquely positioned to offer the world a much-needed message of mutual respect, understanding, and ultimately the peace and unity that are the desire of the one who created us all in the divine image. It is my profound hope to further strengthen the already warm friendship that marks, marks the Lutheran-Jewish relationship in Canada today, a shared goal for which I invite every one of you here today to join us. I also want to give recognition today to the ongoing par partnership we have with Canadian Lutheran World Relief and to thank them for their work of compassionate justice around the world. It has been my honour to have the opportunity to see firsthand the work that CLWR is doing in refugee assistance and in famine relief. I know many of you have sponsored refugees as part of the Reformation Challenge. In fact, it is the one area of the challenge where we surpassed our goals. The ELCIC, the CLWR, and Lutheran Church Canada national offices also decided to sponsor a Syrian refugee family. I was really glad to personally be involved in living out our commitments to welcome refugees and have grown through my relationship with the Al-Khattab family. We look forward to hearing from CLWR Executive Director Robert Granke tomorrow. Thank you all for the many ways you participate in the compassionate justice work of our church. Effective partnerships is the last of our strategic directions. We are able to accomplish so much more when we work together with partners. My special thanks to all of our ecumenical partners who honor us with their presence at this national convention and who participate and witness as we hold our national ELCIC commemoration of the 500th anniversary of the Reformation on Friday night. Whether it's full communion, conciliar, or LWF partner church relationships, you are all valuable partners and working together strengthens our ministry and enhances our witness. I want to underline again the wonderful work being done through our partnership with Kairos and the Canadian Council of Churches. I want to lift up the wonderful ministry being done by our schools, LCBI High School and Luther College. 
I give thanks to God for the mutual accompaniment we receive from our partners in the ELCJHL, in the churches in Argentina and Peru, (coughs) and for the Synod's global mission companions. You enrich our lives and strengthen our understanding of what it means to be in mission. There are other partnerships I want to highlight and celebrate. I want to thank National Church Council, and in particular, the officers of the National Church for your hard work and commitment. Thanks also to my colleague bishops for your support and partnership. I want to thank everyone who serves on committees and task forces, synod and congregational councils. And a special word of thanks to the hardworking and dedicated staff of the National Office who have served over the past biennium. They have included, and I would like them to stand if they're here, please. They have included Barb Weeb, Rick Natividad, Desiree Mendoza, Catherine Cravici, Norm Cole, Ken Ward, Gloria McNabb, Trina Gallup Blank, Paul Gares, Lyle McKenzie, Andre Laverne, Gretchen Peterson, Kyle Giesbrecht, Carter Brooks, and Simrat Cower. Would you please stand and be recognized? And let's give them a much deserved round of applause. Thank you. I also want to take this opportunity to send out a personal word of thanks to my parents, who I'm pretty sure are watching today on the live stream. (laughs) Today is the anniversary of my baptism. And... (laughs) I want to thank you for your ongoing nurturing of my life of faith and my life in the church. I love you very much, Mom and Dad. Thank you. I know that I do not work alone but rather that I'm a part of a team of leadership across our church and with our partners. And for that shared leadership and collegial support, I give thanks and praise to God. You know, 10 years ago, when I was first elected national bishop, I was very concerned about the direction we were headed. Our resources, both in terms of people and finances, seemed to be receding rapidly. I wasn't sure that the ELCIC was going to survive. But I've learned a few things over these 10 years. As Paul wrote in Romans, hope does not disappoint us because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. Hope does not disappoint us. I've learned this from being involved in the Lutheran World Federation and learning that we are not a small church. We are a medium-sized church. (laughs) And it's time for us to look at the glass as not half empty, but half full. Indeed, full to overflowing because of the abundance of God's grace. This is what I've learned from God, And this is what I've learned from you as I've traveled across our church. Through your faithfulness, through your witness, through your creativity, through your hopefulness, I have learned that hope does not disappoint. We are liberated by God's grace. We are blessed with a hope in Jesus Christ that will not disappoint us. We are being strengthened to meet the challenges ahead. We are called to be people of faith for people in need. Or as we continue to proclaim, we are a church in mission for others. Thank you very much for your kind attention.